In my last video, I had a go at building a basic oscillator, using a Schmidt inverter and a simple RC filter. I've adjusted the capacitor and resistor values since then to increase the frequency into the kilohertz range, and this is the circuit I've ended up with. In this video, I'm going to adapt this circuit to become a voltage controlled oscillator, or VCO. VCOs can oscillate at a range of frequencies selected by an analog control voltage applied to one of the pins. Already in the last video, I showed how to change the duty cycle by using a potential divider to reduce the voltage applied to the capacitor while it's charging up, which makes it take longer to charge up to the Schmidt inverter's threshold voltage. I'm going to adapt the same technique here to allow an arbitrary input voltage to affect this charging time, and hence the overall frequency of the oscillator. The main thing we need to do is disconnect the old feedback loop, and instead feed the output voltage into the base of a PNP transistor gating the current flow into the potential divider. When the voltage at the transistor's base is high, it is reverse biased, so it doesn't allow current to flow from its emitter to its collector, and so R5 is essentially disconnected, and the capacitor will discharge through R4. When the voltage at the transistor's base is low, on the other hand, current flows from the emitter to base, and so corresponding current can flow from the emitter to the collector. This raises the voltage at the collector to approximately 0.3 volts below the voltage at the emitter, and this voltage is then applied to the potential divider, and the capacitor charges from there. The voltage applied to the capacitor is roughly proportional to the control voltage, so varying the control voltage will vary the capacitor's charging rate, and hence the period of oscillation. To make it still oscillate, we actually need to connect this feedback loop to the output of the second inverter rather than the first, as the transistor itself also inverts the signal. Remember we want the voltage applied to the capacitor to be high when its current charge level is low, and low when its charge level is high. As significant and varying current will be drawn from VCTL through the transistor, the resistors and the capacitor, I'm also going to insert an emitter follower above the PNP transistor to buffer this input and increase the impedance. This prevents the varying current draw here from adversely affecting the source circuit. And for test purposes, I'm going to wire VCTL up to a potentiometer to begin with. Here's the circuit on a breadboard. Ignore the bit in the bottom left for now, it's not connected and I'll explain that later. Over here on the right though, we have the hex inverter based oscillator circuit I made before. Here's the first inverter, and here's the second one. I'm using a smaller ceramic capacitor now to get a higher frequency, along with smaller resistors in the potential divider. The far end of the potential divider now goes to the collector of this PNP transistor rather than straight into the inverter output. Also note that the feedback loop now comes from the output of the second inverter rather than the first inverter as it was before. The output of that second inverter goes through this 5k resistor, leading to the base of the PNP transistor. When the base is low, current flows between the emitter and the base, allowing current to flow from the emitter to the collector, and into the potential divider, charging the capacitor. The emitter of the PNP transistor is where the frequency control voltage is applied. I'm buffering that input voltage through an emitter follower, to increase the impedance of the VCO circuit, so that it has less effect on whatever is driving it. That's then connected to this variable resistor, which I can use to adjust the input voltage. Let's have a look at what that looks like on the oscilloscope. You can see that as I increase the voltage applied, the frequency increases, so the waveform bunches up. When I decrease it, the frequency lowers to a point until I decrease it so far that it stops oscillating. Note that the duration for which the waveform is high is almost as constant as I adjust the input voltage. Just as we found before, when I first introduced the potential divider there, it only affected how long the waveform was low for. So that works pretty well as a voltage controlled oscillator. The time between rising edges of the waveform is controlled by the applied voltage. It doesn't really matter that the duty cycle isn't even. The maximum frequency it can achieve is mostly defined by the choice of capacitor, and I believe the parallel combination of the potential divider resistors. The minimum frequency is harder to pinpoint, because as the frequency decreases it starts getting unstable. 
I think the charge rate of the capacitor when it's very close to the charging voltage becomes less predictable and more sensitive to environmental interference, and that leads to the variation you see in frequency. In addition, when the charging voltage drops below the threshold of the Schmidt trigger, it stops oscillating completely as it no longer reaches a high enough charge level to toggle the inverter. As a teaser for the next video, let's take a look at how this will help us to go on to implement a phase locked loop. I'm going to remove the potentiometer and instead drive VCTL with this new circuit. Q3 is another emitter follower, so the voltage at its emitter will be either nearly 5 volts when the switch is pressed, or a mid-range voltage when the switch is not pressed. C3 then charges or discharges to slowly converge on this target voltage, and this is fed to the VCO. Here's the new part of the circuit on the breadboard. You can see here the emitter follower, resistor divider network, and the push switch that charges the capacitor. Let's see what effect that has on the oscilloscope. As you can see, when the button is pressed, the frequency increases, quickly at first, and then more slowly as the electrolytic capacitor nears its target voltage. When the button's released, the frequency decreases swiftly, and then again more slowly as the capacitor discharges. I'm going to use this to illustrate how our phase lock loop is going to work. The idea with the phase lock loop is that you count the number of pulses a fast variable oscillator achieves in a period of time, measured using a reliable fixed, possibly slower oscillator, and depending on the result, cause the variable oscillator to run faster or slower. I'm going to essentially run this algorithm by eye. Normally a PLL would be counting hundreds or thousands of oscillations, but let's say we have a 20 kHz clock signal with a 50 microsecond period, and we want to generate a clock signal at double the frequency. So we want two cycles of our oscillator to occur in a period of 50 microseconds. My oscilloscope is set to 10 microseconds per division, so 50 microseconds is halfway across the screen. I'll watch the rising edge of the third cycle and try and keep it as close as I can to the centre of the screen. Whenever the rising edge occurs later than the centre of the screen, I'm pressing the button. When it occurs sooner, I release the button. And in this manner, based only on observing the timing of this edge compared to the centre of the screen, I can make the oscillator average 40 kHz the frequency we're aiming for. So, as with the first video, I was pretty pleased this all worked so well, and I hope it was interesting to you all. I'm planning one more video in this series, in which I'll build a digital circuit to do automatically what I was doing manually at the end there. It should be possible to make it quite dynamic, maybe allowing the frequency to be set by a microprocessor or something like that, and then we can experiment to see what sort of stable frequencies we can get out of it. Please like this video, and leave any comments as usual, and if you're interested in the follow-up on making an automatic PLL circuit, Make sure you subscribe and press the bell to be notified when the big video becomes available. And of course, if you try this circuit out for yourself, please do let me know how you get on in the comments. Have fun!